Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today I'm going to be showing you how to take advantage of a huge development lead in chess. Uh, this happens a lot, especially at the amateur level, you know, when you have players that are just kind of like right around that, you know, 1000 to, you know, 1200 range or something in there. Uh, you have these situations where somebody gets a huge development lead because the person playing, you know, whichever color just decides, okay, I'm just going to move a bunch of pawns and you know, a lot of people are curious, like, how do I take advantage of this? So that's what this video is kind of about. So the most basic uh, form of taking advantage of it is this idea kind of called uh, Legal's Legacy. It's actually a, a very well-known trap. But one of them kind of goes like this, where you develop and then they just say, okay, well, I'm just going to move pawns. I'm going to play like a pawn move, or h6 is another common pawn move. People will play h6 to keep the knight out, and then you're just developing pieces, and then they decide, okay, well, I'm going to pin uh, this, this knight to your queen. Well, they don't actually have enough pieces out to justify any kind of early attack here. Once they've decided to just move pawns and hang back, um, after a certain point, they just kind of have to keep hanging back and just hope that they can hold everything. Otherwise, they're just going to get crushed. Uh, because as soon as they make uh, a move kind of with pieces into your position, uh, you have the ability to sacrifice and try to break through. So in this case, the sacrifice, and pause the video, see if you can find it. The sacrifice is knight takes e5, which sacrifices the queen. And then you have this mate in two, uh, which is bishop check, king e7, and then knight d5 is mate. Uh, and this is referred to as Legault's legacy. So what if they do uh, kind of do the correct thing and just kind of hang back and you know do nothing and just try to keep all their pawns back there so that you can't break through well you know this happens uh even on the grandmaster level occasionally uh there's this game that i want to show you it was uh tal versus trignov uh, played in amsterdam back in 1964 and that's kind of what black did in this game he just kind of hung back and just made pawn moves uh he started by playing a perk uh he played d6 and then d4 and then g6 so he's kind of playing a version of the the, it's actually really it's not a perk anymore it's kind of like a modern and remember the distinction between the perk and the modern really has to do with whether or not this knight on g8 develops if, if the knight doesn't go to f6 it's a modern if the knight goes to f6 it, uh, it's it's a perk uh that's really the distinction it's not really the first move that distinguishes it even though if you look it up in the books they'll a lot of times distinguish it based on whether black starts with d6 or g6 uh but both in the modern and in the perk both of these moves end up getting played. So the distinguishing characteristic is whether this knight goes to f6. So really uh, what Trignov is playing here is a modern. And after g6, we have uh, knight c3, Tal just develops, we have bishop g7, and then Tal just develops. So he does exactly what we're supposed to do. Tal's doing exactly what we teach beginners to do. He's doing what we teach kids to do. He's doing what we teach, you know, 1,000 rated players to do. Just develop your pieces and get castled. So another pawn move gets played, and then we have just another developing move, just bishop g5. Let's just take the bishop and put it out. And then we have this move, queen b6. Black is threatening to take this pawn. Okay, so... When you have such a huge development lead, what you're really concerned about in the position is just how do I get all of my pieces into play? Uh, how do I develop rapidly? You're not concerned about protecting pawns. At a certain point, you just don't care so much about the material. Now, this is a little bit daunting to people because I think at a certain level, we don't know how to take advantage of a huge development lead. And we become very materialistic because we're very worried. Like if I lose a pawn, I might never get it back. You have to learn how to take advantage of a huge material lead. You have to learn how to play for mate. Uh, if you don't know how to play for mate in the opening with a huge uh, development lead, uh, then you're not going to be able to play uh, any position, let alone positions where you just happen to be down a pawn. Uh, so in this case, uh, Tau very correctly plays queen d2, says if you're going to waste an extra three moves taking my pawn, go ahead and have it. So queen takes b2, rook b1, he also gets another rook on an open file, uh, queen a3, and then bishop c4. So even according to like modern engines, white has a a sizable advantage here. Uh, white's just doing incredibly well. Black, black by no means has an advantage because he's up a pawn, uh, even, even if you put this on a computer. Uh, so we have queen a5. The queen has to retreat to get back. We have castles kingside, e6, uh, rook fe1. Now everything is ab absolutely everything in the position is developed. Uh, we have another pawn move, a6. And again, this is just once you play a whole bunch of pawn moves, a lot of times you have to play like a whole bunch more pawn moves just to kind of try to justify the previous pawn moves, because you have to try to keep, you know, white out of the position, maybe prevent knight b5, etc. But at some point, white is going to try to 
break through. And Tau begins that breakthrough with this move bishop f4, which is a really simple way of trying to force black to do something to open the position. Uh, black, white is just threatening to play bishop takes d6. He's putting pressure on this pawn, and he's just saying, okay, what are you going to do? How are you going to do this? Are you going to are you going to push this pawn to d5 and let me open the position that way? Or are you going to push this other pawn to e5 and let me open the position that way? And black chose the latter. He played e5, and now the position is open. Takes takes, and now see pause. See if you can find the correct move here. The move was queen d6. Uh, this is a, kind of a classic tal sacrifice. Now what's interesting is. Uh, a lot of people think that tau sacrifices are these intuitive sacrifices with unclear compensation, uh, but if you put most of tau sacrifices on modern engines, they just kind of laugh and say, no, 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 queen d6 is completely winning. <laughs> it's not even It's not even close. Uh, the whole point is there's all these threats. Uh, bishop takes f7 followed by knight g5, for example, is a huge threat, and these threats are leading to mate. Uh, so... Black has to find some way to respond uh, to these mate threats. So the first thing that Black did was Black decided to play queen capture c3. So one of the reasons for this is there's a lot of threats with this knight coming to d5 at some point, and Black wanted to try to prevent that. So he plays queen to c3 to prevent that knight from queen to d5, and then we have rook uh, e to d1, which threatens another mate. It threatens queen d8 mate. That forces knight d7, and then we have this breakthrough. Bishop takes f7 check, king f7, knight g5 check, king e8, queen e6, and black resigns because it's mate in 2. So if, for example, uh, king f8, we would have queen f7, which is mate in 1. And if uh, knight e7, we would have queen f7, uh, king d8, and then knight e6 would be mate. Uh, so that's kind of how you break through. You've got to open the position. Uh, at the right moment or try to open the position. In this case, the critical maneuver to remember was this bishop f4. Uh, just pulling this bishop back, pointing at this pawn on d6 that's weak, forcing this move, allowing the opening of the position with queen d6. And once we played queen d6, it was pretty much game over. There was going to be all kinds of threats on the table at this point. Uh, another example that's often given here is if, for instance, he had played something like e takes f4, taking this bishop instead of taking this knight, white would have uh, knight to d5, the point being that we're threatening knight to c7, which, as you can see, that would force black to sacrifice his queen. And if we take here, we're taking back with the pawn, which opens up this rook. And that's going to be leading to mate as well. So basically, white's getting that critical breakthrough. White's opening up the position, and white's going to be uh, playing for mate and, and getting it. Uh, in pretty much all lines, uh, regardless of regardless of what black does. Uh, so that is uh, basically how you take advantage of somebody not developing. Uh, this game is just a wonderful classic example of that. Again, this was Tau uh, versus Trignov, played in Amsterdam uh, in, in 1964. Anyways, I hope you found that video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.